What classifies as a Sonic game is a bit convoluted, so spare me a moment to share what I'm including. I'm not counting mobile or Japanese arcade games, so I'm sorry to the Sonic Minesweeper fanboys out there. Compilations are allowed if they change the original games in any way beyond just being a port, so Sonic Mega Collection wouldn't count, but Sonic Origins does because it adds widescreen and a bevy of new features. As for the racing games, I've decided to only include the ones that mostly are entirely focused on Sonic. So Sonic R counts, but Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transform doesn't since there's many other IPs included. This same rule applies to the sports titles, so I'm not including Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. Also, I'm not counting Sega Pico or Leapfrog titles because they barely count as games to begin with. Everything beyond that, however, is included, so let's get this massive project started and get her ranked. 72. Sonic Freeriders. Oh boy, we're starting off rough. Unless you're in a perfectly lit room with a reasonable amount of space, it is impossible to play this. I've turned on my studio lights and cleared my office just so I can jump around like an idiot. Most people don't have this luxury. I'm mad that I do because now I have to play this. We'll be talking about the first two Sonic Rider games later on, but this third and last one killed the entire spin-off series. Where do I even begin? I guess with the controls because your body is the controller. You'll move around by leaning your body left and right, and you jump by physically jumping. Thing. It sounds cool, but the only problem is that it only works when it wants to. For the game to process a jump, you need to launch all of your legs into your stomach like you're in the goddamn Olympics. Otherwise, it will not count. And sometimes, it won't count anyway. If you like the strategic gameplay in the first Sonic Riders, that is completely gone in this game. The only strats is praying you can time your jumps correctly and that they work at all. And the laps are way too long. It's like four minutes per stage, which left me wiped after each one. And I'm in decent shape. The game itself is just that demanding. And can we talk about these items? Shake up a soda can to get a speed boost? Where the hell did that come from? What, and a golf club? I don't understand where the idea of using non-Sonic items came from. And before every race, you have to recalibrate your position. It was like this in Wii Fit 2, but at least the balance board was competent. Here, it doesn't seem to matter. And don't even get me started on the missions. So many of them are designed to be as obnoxious as physically possible. But the most annoying part of all this is the game could have been really good. I mean, it looks decent, and the music is still great. It's just, yeah, it's just the controls. 71. Sonic Jam Gamecom I've played Superman 64, E.T. on the Atari 2600, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, all the infamous bad games, I think it's fair to say that I've tried the worst of the worst. Sonic Jam on the Gamecom might actually surpass all of them. Why did they even attempt to make games on this handheld? The only reason, and I mean only reason this is above Sonic Freeriders, is because the controls technically work. Everything else, however, uh, again, where do I even begin? Firstly, just, just look at it. The game Game chugs at a solid 10 FPS at best. The music is straight up gargled mesh. I apologize for your ears, but take a listen. And guess what? When you collect rings, the music stops playing. Honestly, good riddance because the rings at least sound better. And don't even get me started on the physics. They make absolutely no sense. Jumping slows your speed down, and when you build up speed to go up a hill, he automatically gains speed even when ascending. You can spin dash, but only one little spin, and then that's all you get. No more. This collection doesn't even have Sonic 1 in it. How does it have Sonic 2, Sonic & Knuckles, Sonic 3, but not the first game? Well, actually, these aren't even the same levels, so it doesn't matter to begin with. The screen crunch makes it impossible to see where you're going, if you get hit you aren't able to grab your rings again, Flying Batteries music is playing in Mushroom Hill for some reason, there's only one zone per game, the special stages run way faster than anything else. Look, I, I just have to move on. I don't want to think about this disaster ever again. 70. Sonic Spinball Master System Why does there have to be a Master System version of spin-off games that aren't that good? Just look at it! Does this look like a fun time to you? At the very least, the controls function and it looks okay for Master System standards, but the physics just don't care. Sonic will randomly gain speed while going up because... reasons. And look at how much it chugs when you warp somewhere. I swear, the Master System is gonna catch on fire trying to process what's happening. You can help navigate Sonic with a D-pad, which is nice, but I have no will to play much of this game at all. And the music is horrendous. And I'm sorry, but we're only at the beginning of Master System slash Game Gear Sonic titles. 69. Sonic the Hedgehog Master System. This game, uh, certainly is functional. You can indeed push the buttons and Sonic will move. Now, does that make it fun at all? <laughs> uh. 
Yeah, it's basically a Sonic 1D make. The only thing I can really give it credit for is some of the music and sprites. For the time, the sprites look pretty snazzy, and a few of the tunes are catchy. But my god, this game is boring. It has fairly pinpoint controls, but not much beyond that. The first two zones are okay, until you get to an auto-scroller. Yep, there's an auto-scroller in a Sonic game, because that makes all the sense. And things go from mediocre to bad and then dreadful. If you didn't like Labyrinth Zone before, you definitely won't like the Master System version. It's somehow even slower, and spikes can kill you so easily because your hit stun timer is virtually none. And Scrap Brain isn't any better. It's a confusing maze, and it's just not very fun. But on the contrast, the bosses are way too easy. But you know what? At least this game has the world's best ending. Yep, I know, it's pretty awesome. Even Sonic, uh, sings in the credits? I do like the sprite of him because that's goofy as hell, but otherwise, there's almost no redeeming qualities. 68. Sonic Schoolhouse I cannot believe this game has entered my mind once again. This was one of the first games I ever played. I have a few memories of playing this on a computer when I was like three or four years old. As I'm sure you can tell by its art style, this was the game that inspired Baldi's Basics with its super stiff 3D character models and creepy looking hallways. What I always found weird is you can play as these Five Nights at Freddy animals, but not a single Sonic character. This came out in 1996, so there weren't that many characters yet, but not even Tails or Knuckles are here. As for the game itself, it's an educational game. You learn how to do extremely basic math and English, and not much more than that. You grab numbers and have to take them to a chalkboard, and Robotnik can interfere to take away answers. I love all the random Sonic spinball art on the wall. This truly has become a surreal piece of history. It's strangely nostalgic diving back into this school. I'm unlocking core memories while also remembering things like the infamous Windows 95 maze screensaver. I stared at that thing for hours when I was younger, but I digress. You can also go on field trips and watch Sonic Blaze 200 miles down the road while learning about animals. And there's games where you'll match statues and grab rings while avoiding Robotnik. Obviously, there is no reason to ever go out of your way and try to play this, but it's at least entertaining seeing how poorly it's aged over time. 67. Sonic Chaos Ah uh, yes, the most chaotic game ever, because you get to the special stages by collecting 100 rings. Yeah, you just warp there and then you get the emerald. You don't even go back to the level, you just move on to the next one, which is super odd. It is technically better than Sonic 1 on the Master System just because you can spin dash, and there's the option to play as Tails. The controls and lagging are much better, however, but at least it's more tolerable. The music still sucks though, but there are some good ideas here. I really like the hover shoes because you can grab rings in the air, I guess that's kind of cool. And the bosses are interesting, although stupidly easy. Like, literally in Mecha Green Hill, I just chill in this one spot and win. I can't get hit at all. Again, there's no reason to ever play this game. 66. Sonic Blast You can tell that they made a valiant attempt at making this game look nice, but my god, all the extra pixels make everything look so stiff and lifeless. The animations look like they come straight out of a bootleg. It's genuinely that bad. As for the game itself, it's pretty meh. You can play as Sonic or Knuckles, and it controls just about as well as Sonic Chaos, which isn't great. The special stages are at least more interesting. You don't play a new level this time, but run down an endless checkerboard path like the others. But man, Blue Marine Zone has to be the most painful Sonic level I've ever played in my life. You thought Labyrinth Zone was bad? Imagine that, but the game runs even slower, plus it's a massive maze, and there's other pipes that blow water which force you to go a certain direction. But you can barely see which pipes do that! It is absolutely miserable. I was on the edge of quitting, but managed to slog through the rest of the game. That zone is just dreadful, but the other ones at the very least are okay. 65. Sonic the Hedgehog Triple Trouble I can only call this a slightly better version of Sonic Chaos and Blast. You're able to play as Sonic or Tails, the animation is a little better, and the levels are slightly more enjoyable. That's honestly the extent of what I can add. All these Master System and Game Gear games start to blend together after a while. It is interesting that you have to open a box for Tails to fly, or at least I wasn't able to fly with them otherwise, and the special stages are once again just regular levels, and you have to break a box with 50 rings to access them. The same problems arise here like before. The screen Green crunch is horrendous, and the water levels are confusing and miserable. I did like the Sunset Park boss for at least being different, but that was the only highlight. 
64. Sonic the Hedgehog Genesis GBA. The most sorry excuse for a port I've ever seen. This port is infamous for being extremely laggy, having awful screen crunch, and terrible sound quality. I know the GBA and Genesis sound chips aren't the same, but everything is often janky. And guess what? I owned this game as a kid, and I turned the sound off just so the game wouldn't lag as much. And even then, it didn't help that much. What's even worse is that the game doesn't just lag, it constantly changes frame rates which makes it really hard to make precise jumps. And don't even get me started on the momentum. It's completely messed up. You'll sometimes stop sliding down hills for no reason, or fly forward from pushing a wall. And Sonic's jump is busted. I can hit Robonic from way high up when I shouldn't be able to. The music doesn't even hit the right notes, let alone sound good. <laughs> There's also an anniversary mode where Sonic can spin dash, which would have been neat at the time if the port was better optimized. And let's keep in mind that this came out after the Sonic Advance trilogy, so I don't know how on earth anyone approved this to be released. 63. Tails Sky Patrol. You heard me right, there exist dedicated Tails miles per hour video games, and they're both on the Game Gear and fairly mediocre. For Sky Patrol, you fly around as Tails and constantly move forward. You've got a ring that you can swing around to hit enemies and grab poles, but you only have so much flight time, so on the way you'll need to hit candies to increase your endurance. This is actually a fairly neat idea for a side-scroller, it kind of reminds me of Knuckles Chaotix to a small degree. However, because of the, say it with me, screen crunch, it's it's really easy to get hit and run into walls with your instant deaths. It's also very short, you can beat this game in like 30 minutes if you know what you're doing. And keep in mind that Tails is the only Sonic character in this game, not even Dr. Robotnik or the Chaos Emeralds are anywhere to be found. I think a remake in widescreen would really help breathe life into this ring mechanic, and maybe not dying from touching the ground would be a good update too. 62. Sonic Spinball Genesis It's safe to say that I have a huge bias against pinball games. I've always been bad at them, and hate how it feels like luck plays such a big factor in beating them. Sonic Spinball is four levels long, which should tell you how brutally hard this game is. The first map is fine. In fact, the music is one of the most underrated gems that Sonic has to offer. The main goal is to get Chaos Emeralds to unlock more of the board, and eventually the boss room. However, if you get a game over at any point, you go back to the beginning. This is of course a common thing with older games, but for how ludicrously difficult Sonic Spinball is, that doesn't feel fair in the slightest. And it stinks because I really love the game's style. There's moments where you can still move around with Sonic, and the pixel art is still stunning to look at, but the difficulty really kills it for me. I mean, you can get knocked out of the final boss just because you went to the wrong spot a few times, forcing you to climb all the way back up. I just wish I liked pinball games more. This might be higher on your list if you're a fan of this genre. 61. Sonic Shuffle Everybody knows that this game sucks, but does anybody really know why it sucks? I mean, it's a Mario Party ripoff that also happens to be a confusing snooze fest. I'm sure we've all seen this one board, Emerald Coast, because that's as far as most people will ever get without falling asleep. The pacing is slow, the loading times are atrocious, and you don't play minigames at the end of each turn. It's just when you land on a minigame akin to Mario Party 9 or 10. The minigames are fine, I guess. There is nothing very special or standout-ish here. The biggest problem with Sonic Shuffle is the single-player mode, because the computer players are entirely broken. Even if you put them on easy, they will know exactly what to do and screw you over, making it nearly impossible to win. The goal is similar to Mario Party. Instead of coins, there's rings. Instead of stars, there's precious stones, and instead of a dice block, there's cards. These cards can be selected from your hand or the other players, and the computers know exactly what your best cards are. So yeah, that's just a little bit unfair. If there's anything good to say is that I'm a pretty big fan of the cell shaded style. It doesn't look great in this game in particular, but I can imagine a modern 3D Sonic game that would really shine with the style. Also, Dr. Eggman's voice actor killed it. He's very fun to listen to. <laughs> But otherwise, Sonic Shuffle deserves to be forgotten about. Just pretend you didn't watch this. 60. Sonic Drift I remember hating this game when I played it several years ago, so I really gave it a chance this time. And despite only having four characters and awful music, it's actually okay. The controls take a minute to get used to, but once you get the hang of it, it's fun to zoom around the turns and pass other racers. What I do really like about this game is the amount of tracks it has. There's 18 total, and they're all based on a zone from the first Sonic game. This is an incredibly cool idea. I really wish Nintendo would do this for all the kingdoms in Mario Odyssey and add that to Mario Kart or something. But this is on the game gear, so everything kinda looks the same anyway. There's not much for items either. After playing all 18 tracks, there's nothing else to do. You've got free run to try the track solo, and a versus mode that can't be used because, I mean, who owns a Game Gear? 
59. Sonic Drift 2. Well, it's Sonic Drift again. Even the menu UI is a carbon copy. But now we have some new characters like Knuckles, Metal Sonic, and, uh, Fang the Sniper. That is a wild choice. I like having this oddball inclusion. The tracks also have a lot more variety. There's some where you have to drive through tunnels, the Death Egg, and even the Milky Way. It's no Rainbow Road, but it is still fun. My main issue with this game is the track length. For some reason, every track is way longer, and that makes the game a little bit boring since the gameplay is so simplistic. It controls exactly the same as the previous game, outside of a couple new items. But I think it's safe to say that there's way better Sonic racers out there. 58. Sonic Labyrinth. This game kind of lives in infamy for being one of the worst Sonic games of all time. And yeah, it's really not that fun. Sonic moves around on an isometric plane at an extremely slow pace, and all you really do is find some keys and get to the goal. You can spin dash, which picks up the pace pretty gradually, but that's not really the issue. There's just not much to do besides get keys and occasionally fight bosses. The game is functional at the very least, and the levels being bite-sized helps keep things moving. But sometimes, the perspective feels off. Like, say, when you're rolling down a hill and getting rings. You have to be in a very specific spot or you just won't grab them. And the music isn't very good either. It's on the Game Gear, so you can't expect much anyway. It's definitely ambitious for a Game Gear game, but you might as well play Sonic 3D Blast if you're really itching for isometric Sonic. 57. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 Master System Of all the Master System and Game Gear Sonic titles I've slogged through, this one was the most tolerable. That's simply because the stage layouts weren't complete dog shit. The only zone I didn't like was Aqua Lake, and even that one wasn't too bad. The speed feels a bit more amplified, and you've got a couple new elements too, like the hang glider and rail cart. The rail cart is somewhat fun since you actually get some speed down hills, but the hang glider sucks. It's so easy to lose all your speed. One thing I despise about the Master System games is how bland the music is, but Scrambled Egg Zone hits pretty hard. This beat with a good remix could make for a fantastic tune. The bosses are also slightly better than I expected. Mega Sonic was fun to take on, and the others were alright. I still have no reason to ever play this game again, but at the very least, it didn't feel like a complete waste of my time. 56. Sonic Pinball Party. The pinball era. Every big mascot in the 90s and 2000s needed a pinball spin-off game. You already know I don't care for pinball, but I have to at least give props to Sonic Pinball Party for being very colorful and fun. There's only three tables, which isn't a lot, but they do all feel very different and have varied rule sets. What's strange is there's only one Sonic-themed board, while the others are Knights and Samba de Amigo. I'm not complaining about that. It's nice to see some sort of representation of those series. It's just very odd to call the game Sonic Pinball when only 33% of the boards are Sonic themed. There's also a story mode where you have to beat your friends and Eggman at the end. And again, your mileage will vary if you like pinball or not. The presentation is very solid too, but I just can't get past the fact that when I hit the ball, it doesn't go where I want it to half the time. There's a few extra modes too. You can play these Casinoopolis minigames, which are fine, but again, you have to use the table to play, which just slows the slots and then go down to a crawl. And like the other Sonic Advance games, we have a tiny Chow Garden. This game is alright. You'll probably like it more if you already like pinball. 55. Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric Wow, another YouTuber guy saying Sonic Boom is big poo-poo! The thing about this game is that it's not unplayable or anything. There's a lot of glitches, obviously, but the main issue is that it's just boring. And I mean really, really boring. Sega was trying to rebrand Sonic for the 74th time. This attempt was really catered towards kids, which is fine and all, and I've heard great things about the TV show, but man is this game a slog. The missions are just so tedious. It feels like I'm playing some random licensed PS2 platformer, but with Sonic characters in it. Punch the bad guys, push the green buttons, that's the whole game. None of the locations are pleasing to look at either. Like I said, it's similar to a budget PS2 game. And honestly, I don't completely hate the redesigns of the characters either. They look a bit disproportionate, it, but it is a cartoon, that makes them more interesting if you ask me. The cutscenes though are, uh, oh, there's something else. They are so awful and cheesy that you kind of have to love them. But the issue really comes down to the gameplay. Like I said, it is so freaking slow. You can do a little spin dash over and over, but that's the most speed you're gonna get without glitches. And on top of that, it's really easy to get lost. I had no idea where to go half the time. You can't even glide with knuckles or fly with tails. What's up with that? This game is what I would call a playable disaster. 
54. Sonic 06. Going from Sonic Boom right to 06. At least this one is a so bad it's fun kind of ordeal. Sonic 06 really could have been a home run for Sega. In fact, there's a project called Project 06, which is taking the liberty of fixing all the bugs and controls. You gotta commend someone for taking the time to do that, but that's not what we're talking about today. First things first, those loading times, man. They are rough especially if you're playing this on the PS3. Not only do they average 15 to 30 seconds, but the game loads constantly. You legitimately spend a couple hours watching the game load. It's insane how poorly optimized Sonic 06 is. I am a fan of the cutscenes as they're nicely animated, and it's cool that you can play as a ton of different Sonic characters. You'll primarily use Sonic, Shadow, and Silver, but you'll get the chance to use other ones as well. It's just too bad the controls are awful for every character. It feels like you're trying to control a car with only one car wheel in the middle. It's a tricky balancing act. The speed sections are so goofy too. Sonic clips through so many different landmarks and doesn't slow down unless he takes a stock. It's either hilarious to watch or fun if you get used to the awkward controls. And then there's Elise, which yeah, we all know she kisses Sonic and it is a little weird. But outside of that one cutscene, I think she's a decent enough character. At least she actually matters to the plot and manages to mean something. Plus the music is amazing, although that could be said for almost every Sonic game in existence. But I'm kind of cherry picking here. There's no reason to ever play Play through Sonic 06 unless it's for laughs with friends. The controls are simply awful, and the loading screens can be unbearable. Sonic's campaign is okay, but Shadows and Silvers are miserable. Shadows got a bunch of boring driving sections, and then of course there's the infamous ball puzzle with Silver. And as the wise would say, it's no use. 53. Sonic Classic Collection I had no idea there even was a compilation of Sonic games on the DS until this video, and I wasn't missing much. It's absolutely hilarious that the menu uses the same Sonic Jam music, just like Sonic Origins does, but man, there's really no reason to play these games on the DS because they don't run very well. Much more playable than Sonic on the GBA, of course, but that's not really hard to beat. It feels like I'm playing these games anywhere from 20-30% to 30 slower, so again, everything is functional, but why why would you ever choose to do this? You do get the option of playing as Knuckles in Sonic 2 and 3, but not Sonic 1. Which is odd, because you could do that with Sonic Jam, so I'm not sure why that isn't future here. They also removed all the multiplayer options. It's so weird seeing the Sonic 3D title screen now. It just looks empty. But hey, you get some illustrations, which we've seen a dozen times already, and you don't have to do anything to unlock them. They just exist. The strangest part of this game, though, is the save and load buttons on the touchscreen. Just take a good look at this. I mean, what does it look like to you? Save states? Right? Well, <laughs> no. When you, uh, when you save and reload, it just saves the act you're on. And that's it. Which is nice for Sonic 1 and 2, but I did feel a little debated, I'm not gonna lie. 52. Sonic and the Secret Rings. If you ever wanted to move Sonic with motion controls, then boy oh boy is this the game for you! And even better, Sonic runs automatically. The perspective is admittedly pretty cool looking, but this game just does not control well at all. Even just backing up is a pain, because the camera doesn't turn around for you to see where you're going. Jumping slows you down, so you're incentivized to jump as little as possible. Ugh, if only there was a way to control Sonic's movement manually. And the craziest part of all this is that you unlock moves to make your moveset smoother. That just makes no sense to me whatsoever. Why make your game less playable at any given point? The levels are pretty fun locales, but the structure could be better. You play these levels like they're missions, which might seem okay, but you just end up replaying the same level over and over again with slightly different tasks. Honestly, this game might have been decent if we could just use the joystick and buttons to move around. And like usual, the sound design is awful. Often Sonic will talk, but the music is way too loud. And speaking of music, I hope you like the theme song, because you're gonna hear it a lot. It plays every time you're on the menu, and even during the final boss. And that's not all Secret Rings offers. There's also a bunch of party games because, you know, it's the Wii. But these games can use a GameCube controller, while the main game can't, which makes total sense, of course. Most of these party games are blatantly ripping off Mario Party and just aren't fun. There were only a couple that were alright. I know Sonic Rings has its fans, but I am not one of them. 51. Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 1 It's truly painful that Sega used the classic Sonic title in vain for this College Flash project. This was supposed to be the revival of the classic Sonic games, but instead it buried them further into the ground until Sonic Mania came out several years later. The controls are uncomfortably stiff. You can even roll down a hill when you're in a ball. And for some reason, you're able to lock onto enemies, although that's not needed in a 2D space. 
It makes sense in 3D since controls are more precise, but in Sonic 4, it makes the game too easy and short. In short it is, you've got a total of four levels to play. The point of that was because this was originally going to be an episodic series, but it flopped so hard that it only ever made it to episode 2. For the stages themselves, it's nothing interesting whatsoever. Splash Hill Zone is Green Hill, Casino Street Zone is Casino Night, Lost Labyrinth Zone is Labyrinth, and Mad Gear is Metropolis. There's no originality with this theming. Even the bosses come from the older games. Plus, the special stage is a ripoff of Sonic 1's. Why would you pick that one? No one likes the Sonic 1 stage. Come on, guys. But to give it some points, the music is decent and the art style is... it's not bad. If you really want to play this bad game, you finish it in an hour and you'll be done. 50. Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 2 Well, they did fix a couple things. The physics for one are a little bit better, but it still doesn't feel all that great to play. Some of the stages are more inspired too, but there's still a lot of elements like the special stages that are ripped from the originals. And look, I've got no issue with paying homage to something that's nostalgic, that's totally fine. The issue here is that Sega constantly does this, and the game is called Sonic the Hedgehog 4, implying that most of the content should be original and stand on its own. But moving on, Tails is in this game, which is pretty cool, so I'll at least give it that. There's also the option to use Metal Sonic to play harder stages, but I don't know who would care at this point. If you really want to kill an hour, I guess this game would be okay as a last resort. If you have nothing else to play, all that's available is this, I guess you're fine. 49. Sonic Eraser This just might be the shortest puzzle game I've ever played in my life. The goal is to make matches of two or more, but the puzzle pieces can't move. All you can move is the colored gems themselves, so for what it is, it's pretty fun. But literally, once you clear one level, the credits roll and you're done. At least with the mode I was playing, there are other ones, but they're all very similar. But the best aspect of this game is that you can punch Sonic in the f face if you make a big combo. I was not expecting that in a puzzle game of all places, so it was cracking me up. But yeah, that's really all there is. There's also a two-player mode, but that's the extent of Sonic Eraser. This is an interesting game because it was only released in Japan, and the only reason I'm counting it in this video is because this style of puzzle games are a universal language and can be played by anyone. This game was also only available to those that use the Sega Mega modem with the Sega Mega Net subscription service, so most people don't even know this exists. 48. Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine Master System Your mileage is going to vary with this one as it barely counts as a Sonic game. It's Puyo Puyo, but kind of Dr. Robotnik themed. Strangely, I'm not sure if I prefer this version over the Genesis one. The Master System version obviously looks a lot worse and the music is kind of trash, but it almost feels more fluid to play. The bounciness of the Puyos is more concrete in a way. It's really hard to describe. Now, I've never been good at Puyo Puyo, so this is not one of my favorite puzzlers. Tetris is more up my alley, but I imagine you'd like this game more if you already like Puyo. And interestingly, the Master System variant has a puzzle mode while the Genesis one doesn't. 47. Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine Genesis the one that we're all a bit more familiar with. It's the same as the Master System one, but it looks a lot nicer and has catchier music. I did always find it weird how we don't play as Sonic characters, but instead as Beans. As I'm sure you could guess, it was originally using entirely different characters, but the international release slapped on Dr. Robotnik. 46. Tails Adventure After playing like 20 lame Game Gear and Master System games, I was pleasantly surprised with this one. Tails Adventure isn't a typical Sonic game. It's a Metroidvania where the goal is to take out the Cuckoo Empire and find Chaos Emeralds. The Emeralds are pretty awesome as they increase your flight stamina. It's too bad Sonic can't enhance his moves one Emerald at a time in his games. For a Game Gear title, Tails Adventure is shockingly solid, at least if you have a map pulled up. This is the era before you could pause and see a map screen, so without it, it could be easy to get lost. Even the music is pretty catchy. It's nothing mind-boggling, but it gets the job done well. The best part, though, is just how versatile Tails is. Most of his weapons consist of bombs. There's napalm, remote, triple, and even a remote bomb that can squeeze through tight openings. While I wouldn't normally go out of my way to play this, it was a solid time overall. 45. Shadow the Hedgehog I guess you could unironically call this the black sheep of the franchise. I played maybe an hour of Shadow the Hedgehog years ago, but I never bothered to finish it. And let's just say it was for good reason. But let's start with the positive, shall we? The music is fantastic. It rocks hard and the songs give you an adrenaline rush as you play. And some of the cutscenes look pretty nice as well. There's a fairly diverse amount of locations to visit too, my favorite being Mad Matrix. The vibrant colors really pop out. But as for everything else, ugh. 
you'd think Shadow the Hedgehog would control the same as Sonic Heroes, which was fairly competent for the most part, but no, they actually adjusted things and made it worse. How and why would they do that? The turning now is way too sharp. It feels like you're running around on thin ice the entire time. That's not to mention that you build up speed way too fast, and the freaking light dash only works when it feels like it. Half the time you don't go through the row of rings. And then there's so many new mechanics, the main one being guns. This game is obsessed with guns. The f***ing menu buttons use gunshots. It's so stupid that I love how overboard they went with this theme. Unfortunately, the guns are a mixed bag. You can still use homing attacks to kill robots or humans, but the guns do the job way faster, so you're incentivized to use them. And there's actually a huge variety of them to pick from. The problem is that you'll often run out of ammo quickly, and if this happens with enemies nearby, it takes twice as long to get through sections that require you to remove all enemies. There's also vehicles you can drive, but they don't really add much besides slowing the game down more. But at least they control okay. And the levels are just a mess. Some of them have decent level design that flow well, while the later ones are just awful. It's not even that these levels are difficult, they're just so long and so confusing. These levels being confusing is a massive hindrance to the entire game because it's meant to be played multiple times. That's right, this is one of those games with multiple endings and you have to be the bad or good guy to branch to specific paths. That means that you're going to play the first level at least 10 times assuming you do everything perfectly. And for the so-called endings, half of them repeat the bosses over and over and it all leads to one last story. So it's entirely pointless anyway. Egg Dealer has to be the worst final boss I've played in a Sonic game by the way. You literally literally just hit the slots until you get lucky with the right matches. Why would Eggman program like this? I, I just... <sighs> anyway, moving on. A lot of people think that Shadow is really cringy in this game because of how edgy he is, and he says damn every time he dies. And at first, I thought it was hilarious and stupid, but after playing for several hours, it was just stupid. Because of the sloppy controls, a convoluted story, and being forced to repeat levels multiple times, this makes this one of the weakest 3D Sonic games of all time. If it played exactly like Sonic Heroes with a normal level structure, this game could have been great. Hell, they could have even kept in the guns, they were a nice change of pace. But yeah, this is yet another game I won't ever be touching again. 44. Sonic and the Black Knight I read so many articles about this game in Nintendo Power, and I was never convinced it would be fun after getting burned so badly on Secret Rings as a kid. But this manages to be an improvement in a multitude of ways. First off, Sonic with a sword is a really awesome idea, and it works shockingly well. They gotta go back to this idea in the future to some extent, the setting just feels right. You no longer move Sonic with motion controls, thank god, but with a normal joystick. Everything is mapped to buttons actually, except swinging your sword, which is... Fine. It's a lot of waggling your arm around, but I'm not dying over that fact. The story is pretty interesting for once. The sword Sonic uses is an entity and keeps calling Sonic a knave until you get to King Arthur. That's who the bad guy is. Eggman doesn't really have any involvement. You'll also have to fight Knight Knuckles, Shadow, and Rouge. And I always feel weird saying a Sonic character looks badass, but damn, they really do with the Knight Helmets. Surprisingly, Sonic has actual character development and you can kind of feel it. He starts off really cocky, but slowly grows to become more noble as he gets better with the sword over time. Like Secret Rings, the stages are all super short and take about a minute or two to beat. Because the controls are vastly improved, it's way smoother to plow through levels. Turning still feels stiff though, and backing up sucks again because you can't move the camera. But but I'll give the game credit for being like 90% competent. At least for the first half of the game. There is a lot to play if you really want to. After beating King Arthur, there's a ton of post-game content to tackle. But before getting to that, can we talk about how awful he is to fight? You have to time your first swing against him so precisely that this may in fact be the most obnoxious timing I've dealt with for a video game, period. I swear, it's complete luck when you're supposed to swing, and after defeating him, it turns out he isn't even real and Merlina was debating us the whole time. So this annoying fight was for nothing. Thanks a lot, Sega. But at this point, you can play as Knuckles, Shadow, and Rouge, which is super cool because they have slightly different attacks, but the stages after this are a pain in the neck to get through. It's just more and more waggling with tougher and tougher enemies. But Dark Queen is a really badass boss. The ending to it is perfection. Sonic slashes this massive monster and she screams in agony for several seconds, and Sonic follows up with a thumbs up. I love Sonic sometimes. The music is fantastic as well, but that's not a surprise. It does its job fitting with the game's environments. The locations themselves are gorgeous too. Every place is filled to the brim with small details that bring these worlds to life. So while I'm glad to have finally played this, I really just want to see a better attempt with Sword Sonic in a modern game. 
43, Sonic the Hedgehog Genesis. Similar to the original Super Mario Bros., this game has not aged super well. Of course, Green Hill Zone is fun to blast through, and the music on each stage is infectious. But let's be real, do you really enjoy playing any of the other zones? I bet these special stages are great under the influence, but otherwise they're really annoying. You have no sense of control, and the stupid R circles change the rotation making it hard to plan your jumps out. Marble Hill looks great, but it's just really boring. You'll stand around on these blocks half the time, and these spike platforms take forever to go up and down. Spring Yard is a little better, but the springs are a pain to bounce around, and there's more sections where you just stand around waiting for platforms to move. After the exhilaration of Green Hill, this is straight up lame. Labyrinth is an awful water stage with spears and enemies who either can't avoid or don't see coming until it's too late. Starlight is a lot better, but it's ruined by the fans since they don't work correctly. And Scrap Brain is kind of a combination of everything annoying. Waiting around, too many obstacles, and water. But as for the bosses, they're very okay. The final one is so disappointing because it feels like it ends too soon. And the other ones aren't very memorable outside of Star Lights, which has you launching spikes of yourself into the air. If for whatever reason you haven't played this game yet, try Green Hill Zone and then dip. It's really not worth playing Sonic 1 beyond that unless you're playing a version with unlimited lives. 42. Sonic Forces. Five years in development, and this is somehow one of the most disappointing Sonic games we've ever gotten. Like Sonic 06, this should have been a really good time, but instead we got a three-hour adventure that feels very rushed and unpolished. There's definitely some fun to be had when you're using modern Sonic and even your OC, but as soon as you start getting into the groove of the level, it ends. Every level is like one to two minutes long, which is way too short. This was fine for Sonic Colors because there's lots of levels in one world, but there's only 30-ish levels in the entirety of Sonic Forces. And don't even get me started on Classic Sonic. For some reason, he somehow controls worse than he did in Sonic Generations? How did they even mess that up? It was perfectly competent before. Classic Sonic feels very stiff, and frankly doesn't need to be in the game at all. He's literally just there so Sega can cash in on a few extra nostalgia sales. The big hook is none other than the OC character, and I actually really like this. Was the customization kind of lame? Yeah, it was, but I enjoyed the stages for what they were. You can also play a Shadow for a total of three whopping stages, so enjoy that I guess. But hey, at least we can play everyone's favorite area, Green Hill Zone. There's only eight different stages in that location. Oh, and don't forget Chemical Plant, another underrated one. I really am a big fan of the concept and the main villain Infinite, it's just the execution is all over the place. 41. Knuckles Chaotix. This has to be the strangest 2D platformer I've ever played. Here we have a game that's on the 32X, a random add-on for the Genesis that most people didn't have, and it doesn't really have Sonic in it outside of the credits. You play as two characters that are linked together by rings, and you kind of just lasso yourself around. While it's a really creative idea, it's nearly impossible to maintain speed doing this, and it just feels awkward to control. So thank god Charmy the Bee is playable, because he essentially breaks the entire game by being able to fly around. Speaking of the stages, there's five zones per location, and you play them at complete random. I'm not sure why it's set up like this, probably because there's so many levels in one place, but it's still really bizarre. I just can't get past the controls. This would have been a pretty solid game if they didn't force us to use this team mechanic. The music is alright. There's a couple of catchy tunes, but a lot of it is forgettable as well. The art style really reminds me of Sonic CD. Even the level design is similar since there's multiple different pathways and plenty of the sound effects carry over. But the weirdness doesn't stop there. You may have noticed that there's no live counter. Yeah, that's because you have infinite lives, which is, uh, shockingly weird way ahead of its time for a 90s game. And man, the stages are funky. I actually kind of like these. You run around in 3D collecting blue spears and rings. The rings add to your timer, which is a great incentive to get them going into the special stage. It's a little on the janky side, but for the most part, it's just fun to run through these. You don't even get chaos emeralds in this game. You get chaos rings. And oh man, the ending. The rings circle around the screen, and you get a slow zoom in of the words, cool. Wow, what an awesome ending. You really can't top that, can you? I'm glad to have finally tried this game out, but like the previous 40 Sonic titles, I never have a reason to play this one again. 40. Sonic Rivals. Look at that box art. This game looks awesome. Sonic and pals zooming across a field. Oh, what kind of game could this be? Well, it's on the PSP and you'll race someone over and over again. But why are you racing? Simple. Uh, yeah, because the game said so. Like, seriously, everybody is racing each other to beat up Dr. Eggman first. Because why work together when you can race instead? Visually, the game looks really nice and the locations are varied. There's a lot of sweet camera angles and the gameplay is fine. The physics can be really wonky at times, though but for the most part the game is playable. But yeah, you really just race someone and can also utilize power-ups to slow them down or speed yourself up. Which by the way, the speed-up power-up is a star instead of Sonic
animatronic shoes, which just feels wrong to me. Even with the boss fights, you're supposed to hit them more times than your rival. That is just weird as hell. It makes the bosses seem like a complete joke. Once you've played a few levels, you've basically played the whole game. It doesn't really change much. You'll also collect cards as you go, and there's some great ones like Tails Doll and 06 Sonic. Silver is cool to have as a playable character, I guess, but I don't know. I feel like this game should have been a more fleshed out minigame on a big Sonic title instead of a standalone release. But hey, it got a sequel, so who am I to say? It's decent for what it is, but nothing special. 39. Sonic Rivals 2 If you've played the first Sonic Rivals, you've played its sequel as well. Although to give it credit, there's a lot more going for it. For one, there's twice as many playable characters. The general look of the game is beefed up too, like more interesting camera swoops and interactions. And I like the music more as well. There's a couple bangers hidden inside. But even still, it's basically the same thing. Race your rival for no reason and take out the bosses. There's also a new battle mode, but that's not enough to really make you say, Oh, well now I have to play this! The best part of the battle mode is getting a KO which makes characters T-pose. Yep, that is just what I needed. 38. Sonic Boom Shattered Crystal One of the two 3DS Sonic Boom spin-off games. It's weird that that many released, but honestly, these aren't half bad if you're looking for something lighthearted. The gameplay is way different to Rise of Lyric on Wii U. Here, we've got a 2.5D side-scrolling adventure game where you go around levels, collecting various objects, and finding your way to the end. As you go through, you unlock more characters which have different abilities which allow you to explore all the levels deeper. Tails lets you fly up these wind turbines, Styx has a boomerang, and so on. It controls pretty well and looks decent, although the music is fairly lackluster. The big issue is that it's just really boring and unmemorable, but to be fair, the game's pace is way slower than a typical Sonic game, so it does make sense. Along the way are these racing and auto-scrolling tunnel sections, which are a fun change of pace, but if you don't like backtracking, you are not going to like this game. Shattered Crystal is full of backtracking. You need to find all the shards and blueprints in a stage to unlock Sonic badges, which are required to unlock each level. You can't really half-ass your way through. You're encouraged to explore and find just about everything. I really wish the levels and music were more interesting, because this can make Shattered Crystal a bit of a slog. But this is the first Sonic game we've talked about that I'd recommend trying out if you can find it for cheap. 37. Sonic Boom Fire and Ice I don't know if anyone remembers this, but Sonic Boom Fire and Ice has a big box which comes with this DVD holding a few Sonic Boom TV episodes. That's pretty neat. Maybe I'll watch these at some point. No, I, I'm, I won't, I promise. But on to the game. Sonic and friends randomly get Fire and Ice powers. We don't know why this happens, it just does and it's accepted almost immediately. Thankfully, that makes the levels a bit more interesting to play this time. Sanzero Games really took the feedback to heart from Shattered Crystal and fleshed out just about everything to make this sequel better. Hell, they delayed this game, and that rarely happens for Sonic titles. The biggest and best difference is collectibles are no longer required for level progression, and thank god for that. I still think Shattered Crystal is decent, but I definitely prefer to plow through levels, and if the game is fun enough, then I'll go for 100% and not be forced into doing so. The movement is also smoother in ways I think a lot of people haven't noticed. The homing attack and Sonic's dashing is much faster for one, hitting objects that give you rings are automatically given to you instead of having to manually grab them, the general speed is faster, even sticks Boomerang is more responsive. The side games are also more enjoyable too, especially the racing. This is what Sonic Rivals should have been, a little side game in between the main game. The levels are also shorter and more condensed, and the boss fights are pretty solid. So while that's all good and dandy, the overall vibe is about the same. The level design and music aren't particularly memorable again, and like the first game, there's lots of segments where the game plays itself with a billion boosts and it gets tedious just watching. It's sad that Fire and Ice turned into a slog because I love seeing all the improvements they made. It does pick up in the end a little bit, but it takes a while to get more stimulating gameplay. Also, what is up with getting hit? Because when you get attacked in this game, you fly back to a certain spot of the stage instead of just getting knocked back. What kind of sense does that make? I think Sega could come back to this Metroidvania-style game again and flush it out even more. Although Tails Torpedo missions are still dumb because you have to constantly tap the screen to reveal the map. It's not hard, guys, it's just annoying tapping the screen every 5 seconds. 36. Team Sonic Racing did you forget this game came out too? Because it's probably one of the most forgettable Sonic games. You can pick a team of three Sonic characters and, uh, race around the tracks. The team mechanic is a novel idea and a fun throwback to Sonic Heroes. You'll pick a team and try to place as high as you can for an overall score. There's also an ultimate meter you can build up to get some blazing speeds temporarily, and items can be used like any other kart racer. It's a decent enough idea, but definitely frustrating if your computer teammates are racing poorly. There's not much you can do to help them. You've got a good amount of stages to pick from, but if you've played the Sega All-Stars racing games, you'll notice that a lot of these tracks are ported over, which is disappointing. 
And honestly, those games are a lot better, especially Transform considering the laps change and your car transforms into different vehicles. I'm not counting those games for this video because they have so many other Sega related characters, but those are by far the better games. Even this character roster is bizarre. No Cream, Espeon, or Charmy even though the other Sonic Hero characters are here. There's also an adventure mode, but there's not much to say about it. It's super bare bones and the cutscenes are just images of the characters talking. Team Sonic Racing could have been a lot better if there was a bit more effort put into it, but at the very least, it does control quite well and can still be fun to play in general. 35. Sonic R. Ah, my biggest guilty pleasure. This game kinda sucks, but god I love it so much. There's a good amount of characters, but a lot of them aren't worth using. Amy is insanely slow in her car, and basically all the unlockable characters besides Super Sonic are inferior to their counterparts. And we get five tracks? That is a pathetic amount. That's not even close to enough. But why would I be putting this game above Team Sonic Racing? Frankly, I think it's way more interesting than it has any right to be. First off, the music is simply bliss. It doesn't fit at all with the tracks, but it sure is catchy. And the idea of physically running is just awesome, despite how bad the controls are. This is the one franchise where a racing game on foot actually makes a lot of sense. And it's really too bad that Sega has never attempted to make a sequel or reboot this idea. And yes, the stages are open world in a sense and are easy to get lost in. But that's also really unique, and it's taken to its full potential. Potential. To unlock the characters, you have to go through doors that require rings to grab S-Coins or Chaos Emeralds. Oftentimes, these doors are hidden well, so you have to plan a route out to get rings, grab the emerald, and still secure first place. Since there's only 5 stages, it's not as much of a headache to do as you'd think. And the multiplayer modes are pretty sweet. You've got Balloon Hunting, where you have to be the first person to find 5 balloons. Again, this only works because the stages are openly built. And then there's Tag, which is just hilarious. You literally have to tag everyone to win. Name another racing game that does that. I bet it'd be hard to find one. So yeah, Sonic R is probably still worse than Team Sonic Racing, but I don't care. 34. Sonic the Fighters, a 3D fighting game. It's one that I strangely feel nostalgic towards only because it was available in Sonic Gems Collection. There's not much to this game. You get a roster of characters, a handful of stages, a short arcade mode, and the option to play with someone else. That's about it, and I freaking love its simplicity. Now, I've always been really bad at fighters, and this one is no exception. But every character is fun to use since they all control so differently. I always liked using Sonic. His fast and speedy playstyle works great for me. But then you get some super obscure choices like Bean the Dynamite, Bark the Polar Bear, and Fang the Sniper. Fang is a cork gun, Bear will tear you in half, and Fang really likes pecking at your brain. It seems like the music has always been so underappreciated for Sonic the Fighters because it does a fantastic job capturing the fighting essence while retaining some of Sonic's charms. I'm a huge fan of the art style as well. I can't get enough of these early 3D Sonic models, so the characters look great to me. With that said, there's bigger and better fighting games out there, even back when this was released. But every time I pop this game in, it's always fun in short doses. 33. Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood I feel like I'm playing a Sonic Flash game from the 2000s, and I'm actually having some fun with it. Yeah, this is probably my biggest hot take in this video, but I actually kind of enjoyed Sonic Chronicles. As you can see by this footage, this is an RPG. It was made by Bioware, as wild as that sounds, which means there's multiple dialogue boxes throughout the story. So if you want to make Sonic talk like a sarcastic asshole, then by all means go for it. It's very amusing. Almost the entire game is controlled with the touchscreen, moving around on the overworld map, selecting items, combat, just about all of it. While I definitely prefer to use the D-pad for walking around the overworld, I really don't think it's that bad. It's easy to get around. I guess it's kind of annoying with your hand being in the way sometimes, but it works. There's a lot to dive into for this game. Next, I have to go over the combat. At first, I thought it was completely broken. The combat is somewhat traditional in which you need to take turns to attack, except you plan out 3-4 to four moves in advance and the rest just autoplays. That is besides the POW moves. To use POW moves, which by the way you need to do because they're way more effective than normal attacks, you'll need to drag your stylus across the screen or tap in certain spots to initiate the attack. So imagine Elite Beat A agents, but without synchronized music. The only problem with that is that this mechanic is extremely finicky. I'm not even joking. If you don't keep your stylus inside the circle at the correct time, you can't attack. 
that was until I played more and figured out the timing. You need to push down on the circle slightly early or you'll miss every time. Once you figure that out, that's when the game starts to get fun. The gameplay loop feels really engaging because you're constantly avoiding enemy attacks with a touchscreen while using riskier POV moves. That is until about chapter 5 when evading gets really obnoxious. For no reason whatsoever, enemies will evade over and over again simply to pad out game time, which makes you want to flee every fight. When you're at a point where you want to skip the combat, you know you f***ed up something in your game. As for the other aspects of Sonic Chronicles, it's got all your typical RPG stuff. You can level up, equip items, things like that. There's also Chao, which are like items but stay attached to a character, so similar to making a Pokemon hold an item. Ferox is the best Chao considering you don't have to time your POV moves at all, it just works 100% of the time. Most of the Sonic characters are in this game too, which I was really digging. I mean, look at all these characters we can play as. I'm almost getting Subspace Emissary vibes with this collaboration. As for the sound design, the DS it is, uh, <laughs> oh, it sure is producing sounds. I mean, I wasn't expecting much, but wow, it's really bad. The compression is abysmal. And I know that, yeah, this is on DS, but Jesus, everything sounds like a garbled mess. The only sound effect I like is when enemies die. It's straight up a Tom and Jerry cartoon sound. I've been giggling at this for the past hour, despite it not fitting with this game at all. And the Metropolis music blew my goddamn mind. Almost nobody will notice, but it's actually a remix from Sonic 3D Blast on the Saturn. As obscure as the music is in that game, that's where it comes from. Sonic Chronicles also has a habit of chugging pretty bad. There's a lot of slowdown and even stuttering between the combat and overworld. It feels like the game is going to crash sometimes. It just wasn't well optimized. And also, why the hell can't we switch characters mid-game? There's like four to five places to do this in the entire game if you need to switch characters to get somewhere. That is a massive oversight. I could probably make an entire video about this game because I'm so fascinated and mixed about it. But yeah, despite it being a little sloggy at times, I somewhat enjoyed this one. 32. Sonic the Hedgehog Pocket Adventure, or the prequel to Sonic Mania. It takes a bunch of levels and music from the classic games and mashes it all together. Although the bosses are completely different, and shockingly, this is a pretty solid game. Even if it's on the Neo Geo Pocket Color, the one console that nobody owned, it's worth trying out. The momentum actually feels really good, and the remix chiptunes are super catchy too. Even the art style is well done. It's in the era between retro and modern pixel art. It's the best way I can describe it. The colors are so eye-popping and Sonic Sprite is really well put together. Like most Sonic games, the last couple zones are a bit of a headache just because of the screen crunch, and the pop-in is pretty bad for the special stages, but for the most part, I had a fun time playing through this. 31. Sonic Riders Zero Gravity For years, I heard that this game was worse than the GameCube one, and while I do agree, I don't think it's as bad as people make it out to be, especially if you're playing the Wii version with a GameCube controller. Then you don't have to worry about the motion controls. Zero Gravity is very similar to the GameCube counterpart, but this time there's new stages more characters, and dumbed-down controls. You trick in this game by timing a button press, and most of the momentum mechanics have been replaced with much simpler ones. I mean, I guess that makes the gameplay slightly worse? Sonic Riders has a steep learning curve, while Zero Gravity is almost too easy. There's not really a perfect balance from either game. But even with the easier controls, I still had a good time with the story mode and trying out all the tracks. The music is still fantastic, and the cutscenes are just as gloriously corny as ever. You make turns by slowing down time and boosting at the right moment. And you can also activate Gravity Dive, which lets you fly through the air and build extra speed. These new mechanics are still fun in their own merit. Plus, the unlockable 80s and 90s stages are eye candy that's worth checking out. 30. Sonic Riders. I can't tell you how many times I watched the opening movie to Sonic Riders. This solidified the coolness of this character for me at 11 years old. I loved it so much that I burned this trailer and many others on this DVD. I was obsessed with game trailers before YouTube was popular. I never actually played the game though until now, and it's actually not that bad. Now, yes, I have sampled it a few times in the past, struggling with the controls and getting confused on how all the systems work, but now that I've beaten the game, I still don't get it entirely. Everyone rides around on boards, and you can pick between speed, flying, or power characters. These properties determine shortcuts you can take in the tracks, which makes them fairly replayable. You can customize your board, buy new ones in the shop, which are insanely expensive, each character has its own stats, and we haven't even started racing yet. You start the race by running and trying to build momentum, but also not run into the electricity. I have never seen a racing game do this before. It's still incredibly unique and fun to try timing well. Then when you get on the boards, you'll build speed by drifting sharp enough, hitting other characters, 
character's turbulence and using your boost. This comes from your boost meter that drains, so similar to F-Zero, and you'll fill it by getting air back in your board with turbulence or items. Needless to say, the mechanics are extremely complex, and those that like complex racers will get a kick out of this game. It has a really refreshing flow that is very unlike most racers, but it's honestly a bit much for me. I feel like I gotta be a sweaty gamer just to play well, which I don't always like to do when playing video games. I also really love the new characters. It's a shame we've barely seen them in future games because they fit in perfectly with the Hedgehog's lore. Sonic Riders is fun, but definitely not for everyone. 29. Sonic 3D Blast Genesis I have an unsettling amount of love for this stupid Sonic title. Probably because I played it when I was like 4 years old, but even getting back to it today, it holds up fairly well. The isometric 3D perspective and chonky art style are really different and showcase the 90s time period perfectly. You still save flickies and get to the end, but this time you do so by bopping enemies and collecting individual flickies. Once you find 5, you move on to the next segment. If you get hit at any point, the flickies scatter off and you'll need to grab them again. It's a surprise surprisingly solid gameplay loop as it encourages you to be thoughtful of your movement and jumps. Now, I do have to say that this isn't a fast game, it kind of feels like Super Mario RPG but with a spin dash slapped in. And the depth perception takes some time getting used to, especially in the later levels when your jumps need to be more precise. With that said, the special stages are so much fun, and that's a rare thing to say, having fun with a Sonic special stage? And what's really cool is these stages differ depending on which console you're on. Another big advantage to this game is that if you get a game over, you go all the way back to the beginning, and that really sucks because it's a longer game. And worse, it turns into a bit of a slog by the end, but at least every stage is unique and has solid music. But there's much better versions of Sonic 3D Blast to play, and speak of the devil... 28. Sonic 3D Blast Saturn While it looks better, it's not all that impressive for the sake of Saturn. It looks like the same game but with better textures and animations, nothing was really reworked. And I don't give a sh because I adore this updated version. There's so many new little details, like the titles coming loose in Rusty Ruin, or the ice cracking in Diamond Dust. But the two big differences are the music and special stages. I like the Genesis special stage slightly more, but this one isn't half bad. It's the classic half loop that Sega keeps remaking over and over, but at least here it gets broken up, and sometimes you can jump onto the other floating platforms in the air. Tails and Knuckles also fly you in, and at the halfway point, you get this nice close-up of Sonic giving you a thumbs up. So it's definitely a lot more charming, but now I gotta talk about the music. I f love this sh I cannot express how happy this OST makes me. It's 100% a nostalgia thing, because this was the game I played on my PC when I was really young, but the 90s vibe just fits so perfectly. Whether it's Green Grove's energetic nature, Panic Puppet's tearing struggles, or Diamond Dust holiday cheer, it's all fantastic. And I'm the only person that's probably this passionate about this OST. Seriously, go on YouTube and look it up yourself. It's way better than what's on the Genesis. 27. Sonic 3D Blast PC It's pretty much the same as the Saturn version, but the loading times are a lot faster. So for that reason alone, it's slightly better. But strangely, they changed the special stages again. And I'm not gonna lie, they look a lot worse than the Saturn one and aren't nearly as stylish. 26. Sonic 3D Blast Director's Cut While you could technically count this as a mod, I'm counting it as an official release considering the person that did this was the original programmer for Sonic 3D Blast. It's so freaking cool that he went back to a 20-year-old game to add things. I wish more programmers did things like this. The amount of changes is insane as well. There are so many improvements that make this the most definitive way to play Sonic 3D Blast. The changes include being able to unlock Super Sonic, smoother controls, a better camera, flickies that are lost have a flashing icon, Flicky AI is more likely to follow you, and they don't get knocked out by obstacles unless you have zero rings. On top of that is a level editor, time challenge mode, save game passwords, the prototype crab is added in, and an entirely new hub after completing a level. It's also more challenging to get all the emeralds because you can only get it once per zone instead of banging them all out by the time you reach Rusty Ruin. What a privilege it is to be able to play something like this that came from the original guy. By far the coolest thing I've seen from the gaming industry. 25. Sonic Lost World 3DS Well, I liked this game at first. It really does start strong, displaying actual cutscenes in 3D gameplay. The controls are super smooth, and it's a lot of fun to run through levels. Speaking of running, Sonic's got a run button this time, and strangely, it works well since this is a more platform-heavy title. You can also run up the wall and jump from side to side, which honestly is super intuitive, and I'm surprised more 3D Sonic games don't do this. It actually does a good job blending together the speed and platforming sections, but things very quickly dip, and I don't understand why that needed to happen. My first impression of the special 
special stages was that they looked really fun until I found out that they were entirely gyro controls. And it's the kind of gyro that you can't recalibrate on the fly, which means you have to stand up and constantly turn in place to get through these. Honestly though, I don't mind these stages all that much, but they would have been so much better with normal controls. When I get into World 2 and beyond, the stages were taking longer and longer. Some of them were getting close to 20 minutes in length. That is pretty absurd, especially for a handheld game. But what I mostly don't get is the incessant need to introduce a gimmick that's just okay and form an entire level around it. Some of the stages are really boring and downright dreadful because of this. Like, let's take this freaking snowball one. You gotta build up snowballs and put them into a hole. That might sound simple, but while that's happening, there's always some sort of enemy attacking you, and Sonic will randomly stop pushing the snowball, leaving it vulnerable. Because yes, it can be destroyed, and oftentimes you need to roll it into a massive ball so it fits into the hole. There's this huge snow head that follows you around and it's the most obnoxious Sonic enemy ever. And this level just doesn't end. Why couldn't they have used this gimmick on a normal level for like 30 seconds instead? The boss fights were at least pretty fun and it's interesting to see Eggman and Sonic kind of teaming up since they lose control of the Deadly Six. This could have been better than Generations on the 3DS had it mostly stuck with normal levels. But of course it didn't. 24. Sonic Battle So I've got a fun story about Sonic Battle. When I was 11 years old, I sold all of my Pokemon cards, including a holographic Charizard that's worth hundreds now, for 31 bucks. And with that money, I bought Sonic Battle. Was it worth it after all this time? I mean, uh, it kind of was. This is one of the most unique spin-off games Sonic has ever had. A fighting game on the GBA that moves in 3D using 2D sprites with a fairly compelling story. That's a lot to ask of one game on this handheld, and it works remarkably well. There's a good amount of characters to pick from, and they all have very distinct movesets. Since this is GBA, you do have to pick and choose between a few special attacks which stinks, but it had to be done because there's just not enough buttons here. You can switch special moves after each death, so it's a fair trade-off. The sprite work is wonderful, and the game still looks great. The music has some catchy beats, but man, it really could use some remixing because the GBA sound chip crunches them a bit too hard nowadays. Emerald is this new character that learns your moves and gets stronger over time in the story mode, and he's a really cool robot. You really feel like you're growing with him as he gets better and better, just like leveling up a Pokemon. And the story takes a more serious tone, yet retains the character's attributes. It might be one of the best Sonic stories we've ever gotten, actually, which is surprising considering this is a spin-off. As a kid, I never ended up finishing the story mode, and I forgot why until now. This game pads, and I mean pads. While the story is good, it takes forever to move on because you're constantly being forced into battles. What, you defeated Knuckles? Do it again except for longer. Oh, just destroyed a bunch of robots? Do it again because, uh, I said so. This plagues the entire story mode, which is a real shame because this would have otherwise been a really solid campaign. The difficulty curve will also randomly spike up at times, but usually you can find a cheesy spam strat to get through a tough battle. There's also mini games, as well as a battle and challenge mode, so there's quite a bit here. Honestly, I would love to have Sonic Battle 2. Just make it the same kind of game with a strong story, don't include filler, and add some online play. That would be incredible. Let's make it happen, Sega. 23. Sonic Unleashed I finally got around to playing this game this year, and I was surprised at how much I enjoyed parts of it. The daytime stages are infamous for being some of the most enjoyable 3D Sonic levels out there. The locations are based on the real world, and it's such a joy. There's a genuine sense of speed. You can actually feel the adrenaline rush when you're blasting across the water or soaring through the air. But what about those pesky night stages? Well, they're okay. I wouldn't call these awful or anything, but there's so many overlying problems that could have easily been fixed. First off, every night stage lasts for way too long, and there's too many of them. I appreciate that each one has a couple unique elements in it, but there's so much unnecessary filler. And second, killing enemies takes way too long. You can level up Sonic to make him stronger, which is awesome, but even then, the stronger enemies take multiple hits. It kills the pacing not because it isn't a speed stage, but because there's too many enemies. And don't even get me started on Eggman Land. Good f***. Lord. This level will literally take you like 40 minutes. That is way too long for any platformer stage in any game. And there's so many irritating sections. I could go on and on why Eggman Land is awful. And then there's the sun and moon medals. You'll find them throughout levels and are required to unlock new levels. The only problem is you're very likely to not have collected enough and get stuck somewhere, and you'll find most of your leftover medals in the slow-ass nighttime stages, meaning you'll likely have to replace several of them. Something kind of strange that nobody tends to bring up is the 
large amount of QTEs. This game is filled to the brim with them, and I don't know why, but I do really like the story, and the cutscenes have aged like fine wine. I mean, seriously, this intro is still the coolest 3D Sonic animation Sega has made, and it's been like 15 years. If you're gonna play Sonic Unleashed, get a Series S or X because it upgrades the frame rate from 30 to 60 FPS. It makes a huge difference, believe me. 22. Sonic Unleashed Wii This is not your ordinary port. The Wii version has entirely different levels. There's also no hub world like in the 360 version, which I'm personally happy with since the hubs felt really pointless. It's much more straightforward when it comes to just playing the game itself, and it's overall more enjoyable. Admittedly, the daytime stages aren't as good as the 360 ones simply because of the frame rate. You still feel a nice sense of speed and exhilaration, but the sense is much greater on the Xbox version. The big difference is the nighttime stages. My goodness, they fit virtually all the problems I had before. The stage length is much shorter, and the pacing is a lot better because enemies and objects are destroyed with less hits. It's got the same story, although strangely one of the locations doesn't have any levels outside of a boss fight, and there's still an overabundance of nighttime stages over daytime, but since they're so much more enjoyable, I don't mind nearly as much. The biggest difference is you don't have to worry about finding sudden mood medals to make progress. That alone makes the Wii version superior. 21. Sonic Generations 3DS This is the tail end of ports being different games. Sonic Generations on the 3DS has the exact same story as the console versions, but with different levels and locations. What's really cool is that a lot of the locations are exclusive to the 3DS, like Mushroom Hill and Water Palace. However, most of these new areas don't focus on the handheld Sonic games, and they're all 2D levels. Kid Icarus Uprising and even Super Mario 64 DS worked fine in 3D, so why not Sonic Generations? As for the locations, I personally don't really care that we didn't get anything from the Sonic Advance series or the Game Gear games. Would it have been cool? I guess, yeah, but they still went out of their way to introduce unique places compared to the console ones, that's enough for me. And they even brought back the Sonic Heroes special stages, and it actually controls well. Plus, the bosses are super cool. We get Bio Lizard from Sonic Adventure 2 and Ake Emperor from Sonic Heroes just as a couple examples. The levels themselves are fine, but nothing special. The last couple areas had a lot of bottomless pits, which was annoying, but overall, Overall, it's a decent game. What is bizarre is the first act of each location that was originally in 2D uses the exact same level layout. So if you played Water Palace and Sonic Rush, you'll play the exact same level layout here. And I also appreciate that you can use a couple Wisps in Tropical Resort. That was a nice touch to include those. There's also a versus mode and missions you can unlock. So there's extra stuff to do if you're really into Generations on 3DS. But despite all that, the console version exists. So why not just play that one instead? 20. Sonic Advance Man, I remember spending countless hours trying to unlock Amy as a kid, only to learn that she's the game's expert mode. Like the classic Sonic titles, each character has their own gimmick. Sonic can do an extra slash in the air, Tails can fly, Knuckles glides, and Amy sucks ass. She can swing her hammer at the ground or in the air, and that's about it. I mean, she's awesome for bosses, but she can't curl up in a ball or spin dash, making it really easy to get hit by enemies. As for the stages themselves, there's a few interesting locations. Secret Base and Egg Rocket are the highlights in terms of the aesthetic and set pieces. And there's also way less death pits than Advanced Tour 3, but the game still has its share of bullshit enemy placement. All three of these titles could really benefit from a remake that's widescreen, run in 60 FPS, remove lives, and lets you retry special stages. And let's talk about those because <laughs> uh, the only reason to get all the Chaos Emeralds is to unlock one short zone at the end. And if you really want to do that, you're going to go through some hell. You'll find these blue bounce pads that take you to the special stage, which I found to be pretty fun to look for, but man, the stages themselves are just awful. You're on some sort of board traveling through space, and you have to collect a bunch of rings and avoid spikes. The problem is the depth perception is horrendous. It'll look like you're in line with the rings, and you just aren't for some reason. You basically have to memorize where the actual hitbox is and not pay as much attention to where the rings are. It is just the worst. And in the later stages, the ring count is excruciatingly limited, so you can't miss very many and you still have to avoid the spikes. If you aren't going for Chaos Emeralds, this game is pretty fun up until the last couple zones, but if you are, it's incredibly irritating. 19. Sonic Advance 2 After playing this game again, I realized that it has a lot of the same qualities as the first Advance. They both have amazing starts and rough endings. The special stages in particular are much more fun, and same with the first four zones. The sense of speed is much greater. This is where they first added the boost mode as well as mid-air tricks. Like Advance 3, the tricks aren't just for styling, but allow you to make jumps that you normally wouldn't. As for the locations, they're by far the most interesting of the three games. Music Plant has you bouncing around a bunch of pianos and notes, Techno Bass 
places loaded with techno gadgets that appear and disappear. Even the typical grass slash snow places feel differentiated from most other Sonic games. But alas, there are a couple of flaws. Big flaws, might I add. The first being actually unlocking the special stages. In order to do this, you must find seven special rings hidden in each act without losing a life. And I don't say this lightly, but good luck accomplishing this. I'll be blunt and say that I only played the special stages by using a code. I would have had to take several days to fully memorize every level and be able to play extremely well otherwise. And guess what? You gotta do this for every character to unlock Amy. For the four kids that actually did this back in the day, you are a true king and God bless your sanity. But hey, if you just want the secret level, then you only need the Emerald to Sonic. And the second glaring flaw is the last few levels. There's bottomless pits all over the place, but I don't think it's as bad as people make it out to be. As long as you're using mid-air tricks, you'll probably be just fine. 18. Sonic Advance 3 It seems like there's a general consensus that Advance 3 is the worst of the bunch, but now that I've played all three of the games back to back, I really don't understand that claim. Even as a kid, I remember this game being a lot more annoying, but I actually quite like playing through this one again. The music is surprisingly amazing, the zones have some interesting themes, and the whole character swapping gimmick is unique and I'm surprised we haven't seen anything like this from any future Sonic games. There's something so neat about pairing up two characters any way you want, and each one has special moves that only that pair has. But what about the hub worlds? Well, they're admittedly kind of pointless, but each one is small and easy to navigate. This game does have its share of death pits, and there's more instant death blocks than I wish there were, but frankly, most of this stuff isn't that hard to avoid. Like the other advanced games, it's the last couple zones that suck. Advanced 3 is no different, but at least you do get the best combo to get through it, which of course is Knuckles and Tails. With this duo, you're able to use an enhanced glide that lets you get extra airtime. Plus, you can get better jumps with Tails. And there's so many little things that have been fixed with the general flow of the gameplay. You'll float above water before entering, you can land on rails diagonally, and there's slightly faster movement. As for the bosses, they're a joke. I guess the devs thought they went a little too hard on Advance 2, but now they're just way too easy. Like seriously, I could completely cheese the final boss with no trouble, but I do love hearing Eggman say, you little... One of the most annoying aspects of Advance 2 was collecting the special rings to unlock the special stages, and in Advance 3, you have to find Chow to get to the stages, so it's similar in concept, but better in execution. You don't have to get every Chow in one go for starters, and you can retry the special stage as much as you want, given you have enough of the special keys. But the best part? The special stage is by far the most fair and fun of all three, because the ring hitboxes are way more forgiving. Look, I'm honestly surprised I'm putting Advance 3 as my favorite in the trilogy, but I think it's pretty damn solid despite what what other creators on YouTube may say. 17. Sonic CD I'm sorry, but I don't understand why so many people claim this to be one of their favorite Sonic games. I still think it's fun, but the best of all time? Eh, I don't know about that. It does have this strange mystical vibe to it, being on the frickin' Sega CD and spotting the similarities to Sonic 2 and 3. And this was the game to introduce Amy and Metal Sonic, both are iconic characters today. Plus, those cutscenes are pure gold and still stunning to look at. There's a lot to love about Sonic CD, that is until you get into the actual game. It's big hook is that you can go into the past and future. These change how the stage looks, and also makes them easier or harder. While it's a great idea, it really doesn't make a drastic enough change for me to bother trying, considering you have to build speed for a long period of time. Sometimes there's spots and levels that make this easy to do, and then sometimes it's almost impossible. The stage design is very complex, in fact a little too complex. Some people love the intricacies and all the different routes that you can take to reach the end, and that aspect is great if you play Sonic CD multiple times. Or, you may think that most of the stages are a confusing mess filled with obnoxious gimmicks. Wacky Workbench is a perfect example of this. If you don't meticulously time your jumps out, you jump 2,000 feet in the air and have to go all the way back to the bottom to move on. And the bosses are an absolute joke. There's some good ideas with all of them, it's just way too easy. I mean, it takes virtually no skill to beat them, even with the final boss. And those special stages can be a bit of a headache, but it's a lot better than Sonic 1's at least. Another interesting tidbit is the music. The US and Japanese versions are completely different. Some prefer one over the other, I'm a fan of both of them, and find it to be quite charming to have so much music for this one game. So while I don't hate this game or anything, it's one that I only replay maybe every few years. 16. Sonic Rush Aw oh, man, I remember it being Christmas Eve as a preteen, and the one gift I was allowed to open early was Sonic Rush. It was a tradition for a while to play this game every Christmas Eve to get excited for the next day. I've got a lot of good memories with Sonic Rush, and now the frickin' game's composer has acknowledged my existence. 
which is still such a fever dream that I can't even begin to comprehend. The music is what makes Sonic Rush really stand out amongst most 2D Sonic titles. It's so energetic and catchy, which isn't unheard of for a Sonic game, but the lyrics are used as samples to create the beat, which is very different. This was the first game to have the proper boost, and it feels amazing to use. In general, this game has a supremely satisfying flow to it. All the key features like tricking and grinding on rails from the advanced games are here, you'll plow through ring boxes without stopping, movement is fast and stops on a dime, even grabbing air bubbles takes significantly less time. Also new to the game is Blaze the Cat. She's got slightly different moves, seeing as she can hover in the air and is much floatier. The boss fights are also in 3D, which I need to point out how unreal this was back in 2005. Just try to imagine playing games on a Game Boy for several years, this is what your mind has been enamored with, and out of complete nowhere, the DS arrives, which was the same size as the Game Boy, and it was capable of running the games in 3D. Seriously, it was mind-boggling. But nowadays, these bosses are just okay. They have pretty easy patterns, and you can only hit them once per attack cycle. Although the final boss randomly jumps in difficulty. I don't know where the hell that came from. Look, while I've talked this game up a storm, there's a couple of glaring issues. The biggest thing is the death pits. It's somehow even worse than Advance 2 and 3. They are all over the place. Thankfully, the controls are so tight that you'll be able to avoid most of these pits on the first try. Also, the sound mixing is pretty bad. Why the hell are the sound effects so loud? And finally, the special stages are incredible. They're really easy to access, and you'll use the touchscreen to move Sonic around. It's genuinely fun. And if you mess up a special stage, you can just jump right back into it, since all you need is some boost. I forgot how much fun Sonic Rush was. It was a blast getting to play through it again. 15. Sonic Rush Adventure I really gave this game a chance for this video. I played it a couple times in the past, and it never quite vibed with me like with the first game. But now that it's been several years, I can safely say that it's a little bit better than Sonic Rush. The main thing here is that the level design is so much better in Adventure compared to the first title. There's way less death pits, and the bosses don't feel as mechanical either. There's also a couple new characters, like Captain Whiskers! Yeah, he, uh, he sure is a captain, and that's about all I gotta say for him. Marine is is okay. I don't think she's annoying as some say she is, but I don't really mind all that much. Unlike Sonic Rush, where you just plow through levels, this time you'll sometimes have to grind for minerals to upgrade your vehicles and sail around a map discovering new places to explore. Grinding in Sonic games is inherently stupid, but frankly, I didn't think it was that much of a problem because of how much better the level design is. Each stage is a blast to play, so having to replay some of them or the bosses wasn't that big of a deal. The sailing special stages are also pretty fun, so I have to give that props as well. 14. Sonic Lost World, Wii U for some reason, I never got around to playing this despite being excited for it when it originally released. After the success of Sonic Colors and Generations, the next 3D Sonic game goes with a completely different gameplay style. The most logical step for Sega to take, of course. And it was originally on the Wii U only, but got ported to PC later on. So the main gameplay loop is running around on planets with rapping gravity. Sounds exactly like Super Mario Galaxy, but it isn't at all. This game controls completely differently in almost every aspect, but there were a few moments that you could tell they were inspired by the Galaxy titles, which is cool. One of the strangest mechanics to get used to is the run button, and I thought it was fine. A lot of people hate that about Lost World, but this is a much more platform-heavy title, so it makes sense in this instance. You can also parkour off walls, but I didn't really like this. It worked on the 3DS, but here it felt like it just kind of didn't work half the time. Maybe I was doing something wrong, but it kind of slowed the pacing down too much. But overall though, the levels are fun outside of a few that got annoying. I complained a lot about the snowball level on the 3DS version, and this time you just play inside a snowball and it's way, way better in every way. The Deadly Six are some new bad guys, and they're all really lame. These villains are just really boring personality-wise and not very expressive. I mean, they have this depressed guy that just complains the whole time. I see how they might have thought that would have been funny, but it just doesn't work. I appreciate the effort in bringing new bad guys to life, but even Zavok I don't really care for. It doesn't help that every boss fight takes like 5 to 10 seconds, and that's not even an exaggeration. They go down so fast, and I don't know why they're this easy. Outside of the final boss, which is pretty cool because Zavok grows really big and chases you from the bottom. It kind of reminds me of New Super Mario Bros. 2, but a bit more challenging. The music is pretty hit or miss. Some of them are absolute bangers, while others do just enough to fit with the theme and that's it. There's also some really cool DLC for Yoshi and Zelda, and honestly, these are the best part of the game. For one, you can easily farm lives and animals with the DLC, and two, the levels are just more enjoyable, especially the Zelda one. I played it like four or five times, and it was a blast through each run. 
it's a good idea to do this anyway, because you're supposed to collect animals along the way, and you need 5,000 to get to the end. And you average like 20 to 50 per level, so thank god you don't really have to grind levels if you've got the DLC. There's also Knight's DLC on the PC version, and it's basically a mini boss gauntlet, but everything is replaced with Knight's characters, which is kind of neat. This is a pretty solid game. It's not a masterpiece or anything, but I had a good amount of fun with it and would go back to it to replay the DLC stuff. 13. Sonic Heroes One of the most nostalgic Sonic games for me of all time. Sonic Heroes starts things off on such a high note. Right away, you can play as four different teams, which was mind-boggling back in the day. They kind of all do the same thing, but it's still super cool. Each team is basically a difficulty mode. Team Rose is easy, Team Sonic is normal, Team Dark is hard, and Team Chaotix is the most challenging. There's not nearly as many cutscenes compared to Adventure 1 and 2, but they look so much better and still have the same goofy corniness. You immediately start the game on a huge high. Seaside Hills is a blast to play through. The music is super energetic. It feels like a true successor to Sonic Adventure 2. The main gimmick here is you can switch between controlling a speed, flying, or power character. Sonic Team took what worked best in Adventure 1 and 2 and combined all those gameplay styles into one. And for the most part, it works well. Each character feels distinct and even has a few different attack options. Even the bosses are pretty fun. They require a lot of spamming, but I'd say they're still an improvement over the adventure games. And then you get to the casino levels. That's kind of where everything slowly falls apart. You start to see the cracks a little more clearly, let's just say that. While the controls are functional, they don't adapt well to tricky platforming, which makes later stages a slog to play. And some of them last for way too long. The runtime isn't as bad as, say, Sonic Unleashed Nighttime stages, but they still feel excessive. The issue is that you're sometimes forced to defeat a bunch of bad nicks that have life bars, so it kills the pacing entirely. And once you've played through one character's campaign, you gotta do it through three more times, and the levels are exactly the same. The only difference is that depending on the team, you'll travel slightly different distances, and that's about it. And you have to beat all four campaigns to unlock the final level, so best of luck with that. Team Chaotix is such a mixed bag too. There's a level where you have to kill all 85 enemies, which is just absurd. And don't even get me started on the special stages. The difficulty progression is all over the place, and the controls are so wonky that it takes a ton of practice to get used to the physics. So while there's a handful of bad elements, it does such an incredible job at setting a high tone at the beginning that but I still consider it to be a great game. The music is so freaking fantastic too, and the voice clips ooze charm. Whether it's Tails yelling "Wee" or Knuckles saying "Shit," you can't really go wrong. 12. Sonic Adventure. We finally made it to the adventure games. These are really hard to rank because they objectively have lots of jank, especially this first game. But damn if they aren't a joyride, they still stand out as some of the most unique 3D platformers out there. Sonic Adventure lets you play as multiple different characters, and they all have different levels with varying gameplay styles. These are connected through a hub world, and what's cool about this is that each level feels interconnected within the hub. But at the same time, it feels out of place with these random human NPCs. I know Sonic interacted with people a lot in the two thousands, but it doesn't seem necessary at all, especially since these hubs are too big and can be confusing. And the cutscenes are just, mm, works of art. The lip syncing and audio balance is so atrociously bad that you have to love it. This is very early 3D work, so it's not surprising that it hasn't aged well, but my god, the mouth movements are so funny. Now obviously, playing through the Sonic stages is the highlight. You go really fast. The music's super catchy. It controls decently enough. You'll likely have a good time playing these. And honestly, the other five characters aren't that bad either. Tail stages are very similar to Sonic's, but you're a bit slower and can also fly. Flying can be awesome if you want to break everything and skip portions of levels. Depending on what kind of person you are, you'll either love or hate this. I personally think it's fantastic. Knuckles' levels are pretty easy, but it's still fun gliding around and finding the emeralds. The game is just a little too friendly with the hints. It pretty much tells you exactly where to go each time. As for Amy, she probably has the worst stages. Yes, even worse than Big's fishing. With her, it's very, very slow going. It takes forever to finish levels. It's more cutscenes than gameplay with her, so I don't really care much for her stages. E-102 stages are surprisingly solid. You go around shooting stuff and it's pretty enjoyable. Again, these stages and the bosses especially are too easy, but it's still a good time. But now to big stages. You have to fish for Froggy. I don't know why this needed its own story mode, but as you've heard a million times, it's not the most fun thing ever. It's gone on record by some is unplayable, but really it's not that bad. Waiting for Froggy to hook on and learning for him is just tedious work. The bosses in general are also just way too easy and boring, but Perfect Chaos is so damn gratifying. With Open Your Heart blasting in the back while flying forward to Sonic, you can't really go wrong with this ending. There's also missions in the DX version, and a Chow Garden, so you've got quite a bit to play here. So yeah, Sonic Adventure is still a ton of fun, despite a few shortcomings. 
11. Sonic Colors Wii. So Sega finally said, okay, no more bullshit gimmicks, we're just gonna give you Sonic and normal running levels, and my god, it turned out to be one of the best 3D Sonic games out there. The new twist in Sonic Colors is the Wisps, and these are pretty fun as you'll find them throughout the level and they allow you to transform to get extra speed, jump higher, or get through obstacles in your path. Not every Wisp is great though, Cube just changes some blue cubes into rings and vice versa. And the Spike Wisp is the only way you can spin dash. They had to pull some of Sonic's normal moves away from him to make the Wisp more useful. That wasn't the greatest choice, but I also get it. Each world has a really unique location. A lot of them still look beautiful even to this day. Sweet Mountain is filled with candies and delicious food, Planet Wisp is a vegetated lush land of plants, and Tropical Resort is some sort of vacation area in space. The controls feel great, and the game consistently throws in wild scenarios around these levels just like in Sonic Unleashed Generations. And my god, the soundtrack is just incredible. Something about Sonic Colors music is just so memorable and stands out among the others. The only real issue is some of the levels are on the short side. This was a problem in Sonic Forces as well, but at least that's not always the case in Sonic Colors. And there's plenty more levels in interesting locations. And how can we forget Sonic's all-time best quote? No copyright law in the universe is gonna stop me. Except they do, in real life. It just happens. 10. Sonic Colors Ultimate I definitely have an unpopular opinion here, but I really don't get why so many people hated Sonic Colors Ultimate so much. Like, yes, the glitches were awful on the Switch version, and its extra content doesn't really add a lot. But as an overall package, it's the same great game with a few new bells and whistles. There's even a new wisp called the Jade Wisp, which lets you go through certain walls. I wouldn't call it all that useful, but it's still kind of cool to have a new one included. By collecting tokens, you can customize Sonic's look, which sounds cool. But honestly, it's pretty slapped on and isn't all that interesting. The changes are pretty minimal and bare bones, but at least it's something. And then people have complained about the new lighting engine. I I mean, it looks fine. I guess a few areas look too bright here and there. I don't know, maybe my eyes just suck, but it looks like the same game if you ask me. There's also a new Rival Rush mode where you'll race Metal Sonic. It's basically just time trials for a handful of stages. Again, it's a fine addition. I totally understand why some people prefer the original version, but I personally don't think Ultimate's issues are grand enough to make it worse. But I do have to say, the credits being 30 minutes long is pretty stupid, and the music doesn't even loop, you just stand there in complete silence. 9. Sonic Generations There was a short period in my life where I stopped playing Sonic games because I kept hearing that they were bad according to the internet. But then I got Sonic Generations, and my god what a trip this was. This is the ultimate celebration of what makes the blue blur so great. You can play as modern and classic Sonic and revisit all the best worlds from the past. Nowadays, it's annoying seeing Green Hill Zone recreated, but back in 2011, it was a treat to play it in 3D and then 2D right after that. But you've also got Sky Sanctuary, Speed Highway, City Escape, Seaside Hill, Rooftop Run, every location is just awesome. Even Crisis City from Sonic 06 is a ton of fun. This game is pure joy from start to finish. Now with that said, I've got a couple small qualms, and part of it has to do with the controls. They're pretty damn good for the most part, but jumps don't always feel precise, and the momentum can be wonky sometimes. There's moments where you'll randomly speed up or randomly slow down without warning. But again, it's not game-breaking or anything. For the most part, Generations feels good to play. The bosses are pretty cool too. I especially enjoy how Metal Sonic, Shadow, and Silver are all rivals you can fight. On top of the main stages are a bunch of missions, and surprisingly, a lot of these have interesting ideas to add a bit more replay value. I do kind of wish we got some sort of world from Sonic CD, and maybe a more interesting location from Sonic Heroes, considering Seaside Hill isn't the most interesting looking place. But man, I still freaking love this game. It blew my goddamn mind when I first played it, and the remixes are just incredible too. 8. Sonic Adventure 2 Battle I was considering splitting this with the Dreamcast version, but the only difference are that SA2 Battle overhauled the multiplayer and has better graphics. This is so much better than Sonic Adventure in every way possible. Like seriously, it's hard to not love this game. It features what I would consider one of the best, if not the best, first levels in a video game. City Escape. Holy sh**. This stage is incredible. You immediately start off falling from the sky. The music's all do 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 do, and when you hit the ground, woo! And the guitars start rocking the f out. Oh, it's awesome! I've replayed this level more than any Sonic stage in my life, even more than Green Hill Zone, I'd reckon. You can really feel the sense of speed, adventure, exhilaration, and happiness just bursting in this game. And I even like the Tails and Knuckles stages. They're not as good as Sonic levels, but they can be a great time too. Tails shoots stuff in his mech, and Knuckles glides around looking for emeralds, just like in Adventure One. But of course, this is the game.
team to introduce the ultimate life form, Shadow the Hedgehog. You can play as him, Rouge, and Eggman as well. They're the exact same controls as the hero style. Yeah, that's right. There's a hero in Dark Campaign. Be both of these to unlock the final few levels. If you liked Adventure 1's corny cutscenes, they're back once again in Adventure 2, and the sound mixing is somehow even worse. It's so hard to seriously care about that though when you can feel the passion of each quote as it's bestowed. These cutscenes are the epitome of entertaining for all the right and wrong reasons. Now, like others may mention, there aren't as many Sonic and Shadow stages compared to the others, which is a tad disappointing, but I really don't care that much. The campaigns just fly by, until you get to the very end when a couple levels are just too big or too long. Meteor Herd is a pain in the ass, but at least these missions are harder because you only get subtle hints for where you're supposed to go. The boss fights are still a joke, though, outside of maybe King Boom Boo, but even he isn't much of a threat. The final boss with Super Sonic and Super Shadow is insanely cool, and Adventure 2 has one of the best Chow Gardens we've ever seen. I love these little guys, and playing through levels to feed them animals and vials. The greatest thing about it is the sheer amount of characters you can play as, because it's quite a lot. But that's Sonic Adventure 2. If you've never played it, then you gotta at least try the first few stages. 7. Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles Ah yes, the first video game I ever completed. I had this PC port when I was like 4 years old, and I've got very vague memories of waking up in the middle of the night to play the game for a couple hours, then I would pretend I was asleep on the couch right before my mom came downstairs. Ah, it was a good time. And the only reason I remember this was because this was a daily occurrence for like a year until I beat the game. But anyway, the graphic style looks even better than Sonic 2 and was already a nice upgrade. Everything is well detailed and animated. The special stage are actually fun, you can save and play as multiple characters, and the music is fantastic. So why isn't it higher than Sonic 2? Well, it all comes down to the levels. The first half of the game is alright, but the second half, eh, not so much. Angel Island is a great way to start things off. It takes the whole grassy theming and burns it to a crisp, literally. Hydro City is decent, although sluggish since it's mostly in water. At least these hands give you speed, and you can run across water which is pretty cool, but after that, the levels are just alright. Marble Garden is a confusing mess, and the freaking spike balls do a great job hitting you when you least expect it. Carnival Night is another obnoxious bouncy bounce level, but Ice Cap picks things up at least. And as you'd expect, the music absolutely bangs. I know I've said this for like every Sonic game, but damn it is so good in Sonic 3. Launch Base is decent as well, but now it's time for the and Knuckle stages. Mushroom Hill is littered with obstacles that slow you down to a crawl. Flying Battery is an alright one, but then we get to Sandopolis. This one somehow feels more sluggish than most Sonic water stages. It's that bad. There's just so many random obstacles that force Sonic to move at a snail's pace, none of it is fun. Lava Reef and Hidden Palace are much better either, but at least things pick up a little bit with Sky Sanctuary. It just feels like all these levels focus way too much on platforming, which isn't a bad thing necessarily, but there needs to be a higher emphasis on going fast since that's what Sonic was built for. The final zone and boss are decent, and I'm glad to report that the final boss is somewhat challenging considering you can die in one hit from the laser. I'll just say this, the later stages are more enjoyable if you get super hypersonic early on. 6. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 Genesis Sorry Sonic 3 and Knuckles fans, I still gotta go with the second game being my favorite of the classics. And the reason for that really comes down to the level design. Are there technically fewer stages in the third title? Sure, but they're a lot more enjoyable to play if you ask me. Emerald Hill is basically a copy of Green Hill, but that doesn't make it a bad thing. Chemical Plant introduces water, but only to a small extent. You're stuck in this poison for mere moments instead of minutes. Aquatic Ruin also has water, but again, you can avoid large chunks of it by taking the higher paths. Casino Night is a little annoying due to the nature of this type of level, but even still, there's plenty of flow with your movement. Hilltop is amazing, it meshes together speed sections with platforming perfectly. Mystic Cave and Oil Ocean turn up the difficulty a notch, and still have a great flow when blazing through the level. Now of course, Metropolis Zone sucks. I don't know what happened here, but the stupid starfish and grasshopper enemies constantly get in your way and it's rage inducing. And of course, this one has three acts instead of two like the others. But then you've got Sky Chase, which is a short change of pace, and you wrap things up with Wing Fortress and Death Egg. The bosses have gotten a little bit better in terms of creativity, although they're still too easy. I've just accepted that's how it is. Even the final boss is a joke. Once you know the strategy, you'll never get hit. And I gotta bring up the special stages too, as they're infamous for being extremely difficult. And yeah, they, uh, they definitely are a challenge, especially if you're playing with Tails. You get so little time to react to the rings coming while avoiding spikes, but overall, this game is still a joy to play through. It's kind of insane how well it's aged after all this time. 5. Sonic Jam 
This used to be one of the best ways to play the classic three Sonic games until Sonic Mega Collection. But those are just ports. Sonic Jam actually goes out of its way to change up the classic games a little bit. One of the biggest differences is the difficulty mode. Easy and normal alter some of the stage design and add extra rings. When selecting Sonic and Knuckles, you can choose to lock that on with any of the three Sonic games, which is still a cool idea. Some of the sound effects are different too. You can tell that the most when collecting rings. Things like hitting enemies and collecting the orbs have this meteor crunch to them. The most interesting interesting part of this compilation, though, is the Sonic World, in which you'll play as Sonic in 3D. There's not really anything to do here besides run around, get rings, and check out some extra options. But this was an early build of Sonic Adventure, so it's like playing a beta version in an official game. Nowadays, there's way better and more accessible ways to play the OG Sonic games, but this wasn't a bad option when the Saturn was out. 4. Sonic Colors DS It is absolutely criminal how few people have played Sonic Colors on the DS. I'm a fan of the Wii one, but let's be honest, the DS version is superior in almost every way. The levels themselves are all enjoyable, outside of maybe one at the very end. And that is very uncommon in Sonic games. There's almost always an entire world or two that's frustrating to get through, but here, I had a blast like 99% of the time. And the bosses are so much better than Sonic Rush and Adventure. They actually get harder and you can hit them more than once so it doesn't feel as scripted. And the Wisps work so much better in this game compared to the Wii one, they only bring back the useful ones and actually do a great job expanding the level's depth. Plus, you've got the special stages, which are not only fun to play through, but also unlock a secret final boss. The only negative I can really give is the difficulties on the easier side. I really only struggle with a couple bosses at the end. The final boss is so cool too. I love how you basically have to absorb the wisp from the boss and then use them at the very end to defeat Eggman. It's an interesting way of going about it. I'm not even kidding. You have to play this game if you haven't already. You're not going to regret it. 3. Sonic Frontiers This recently came out, so I can't know how I'll feel about this game long term, but man, Sonic Team finally made a good 3D Sonic. The last decent one was Sonic Generations, which was over 10 years ago. Instead of switching between 2D and 3D levels, most of the game is what is called an open zone, so it kind of feels like Pokemon Legends Arceus or Breath of the Wild. The controls immediately feel fantastic. Zooming around the islands, completing the missions, and finding all the collectibles is such a thrill. I 100%ed this game and even S-ranked the cyber levels, and I still want to go back and play more. That's how you know you made a great game. It makes you wish there was more to do because of how much fun it is. The tone takes a more serious approach, and it's not stupid like in Shadow the Hedgehog. No, you actually care about the story and its characters. The voice actors' performances are much more toned down and mature, and the writing is more complex than what we've seen in other previous Sonic titles. The older games are referenced all the time as distant memories. It's actually insane how much the story has improved. But the best part of Frontiers? The absurdly epic boss battles. Like seriously, just look at this. Beating up huge robots is supersonic and it's actually badass? This is a Sonic game. I'm not supposed to enjoy what I'm doing this much. There's really only a few flaws, which are all pretty minor. It can be difficult to figure out what to do and where to go sometimes, and by the end of the game, you'll end up avoiding the Guardian enemies because you can get their items through fishing. Yeah, that's right, you can fish with Big the Cat again, and it's the greatest thing ever. The fishing's super easy, and if you want to avoid fighting enemies like I did, you can just buy their items in Big Shop as an alternative. All I gotta say is for the love of God, Sega, stick with this formula for the next 10 years, please. Seriously, do not try to change things again because you found something that works and this can be built upon in the future. I swear, Sega, don't you, don't you dare try to change the game again. 2. Sonic Origins By far, the definitive way to play Sonic 1 through 3 and CD. Each game is in widescreen, the pixel art has been touched up, and you can even play the originals if you really want. New to the games are the coins, which allow you to retry special stages. This is huge, considering Sonic CD and two special stages are really difficult, so it's a great update. There's also a mission mode, a fairly big new Zam, and new animated cutscenes for the beginning and ending of each game. It's a great package with a solid presentation. The main downside is they couldn't license all the Sonic 3 music. The alternatives sound fine, but they're not even close to as good. And honestly, Sonic 1 is not fixed because it's and widescreen. It still hasn't aged very well. So yeah, these games are still fun and all, but we all know there's a better Sonic game out there. 1. Sonic Mania Plus It's almost the perfect Sonic game. 
it looks amazing for starters. The pixel art is so well put together. Each song is great and even changes per act. You can play as multiple characters, plus Ray and Mighty, which have never been done before in a 2D platformer. The level design is exactly what you'd want out of a Sonic game. It keeps things fast for a majority of the time. The bosses are really creative and well put together, and the new zones are so freaking cool. Studiopolis is by far my favorite, but Press Garden is a very close second. The intro cutscene animation is stunning, and there's an encore mode that changes up the colors. The bonus stages are actually good too. They made new Blue Spear stages, and even a brand new one in 3D that's actually fun to play. And it uses the adorable Saturn-styled art. Oh, Sega, you found the key to my heart. And you can't forget the Knuckles and Knuckles mode. He's got unique stages on top of that. The only downside is the lack of new locations. It's really too bad that every zone isn't brand new, because they really nailed everything in Sonic Mania. There's so many stage elements that come from the older games and are added in ways that actually enhance levels to be more enjoyable and engaging. It is a damn shame that Sonic Mania 2 doesn't exist yet. Like, seriously, this was one of the highest acclaimed Sonic games of all time, and there hasn't been a sequel yet? I am a massive Sonic fan, and I have been my entire life, but I have to hold my integrity. I am stunned at how many bad and mediocre Sonic games are out there, because a lot of these I never played until this year, and... Wow! So far, I've ranked every Mario game, Kirby, Luigi, and Yoshi. This was the most painful one to go through. It really made me question, how the hell has this franchise lasted for so long when there's so many just mediocre Sonic games out there? And honestly, it really just comes down to how iconic he is and his design. I mean, Sonic is just a really cool looking character and just his legacy, it's, it's something that can't really die. You know, just the fact that there are now so many Sonic games and the bad ones are talked about all the time, it just means that Sonic is always in our minds and regardless of what happens to his games, he can't really fail. And the beautiful thing about the Sonic franchise is there's always that one or those two or three Sonic games that you just absolutely adore. You know that there's something about them that's really bad, but you don't care. You freaking love that game no matter what. And for me, it's it's like Sonic Adventure 2. Not the greatest game ever, but my god, I freaking love the game so much. And anyone that's played a Sonic game, you've got one of those games too. And I think that is what makes Sonic so special. Thank you for watching, everyone. I'll see you all soon.